welcome to the show. Once again, we have a fabulous lineup of guests to energize and inspire you. And you may be wondering why I'm riding this, so stay tuned. It's time to wake up your wow with your host, international award-winning speaker, Kat Vincent. On the show, we hear from Christian Hoff Nielsen on the fun, easy way to travel. Erica Amour on the orchestral dance phenomenon. And Sean Piper shares his unexpected life story of breaking the cycle. And in the Wild Records recording slot with Jesse Wilde, we hear original music from the Vasey Collective. So now when I close my eyes, the world keeps on spinning by. All this and more to wake up your wow. Christian, welcome. Thanks for joining me. And thanks for bringing this with you. Yeah, it's wicked, eh? Yeah. Oh, awesome. So you probably just travel this way all the time. I'm electric most days. Yeah, it's all about fun and ease. Yeah, so it's getting about on bikes, electric, and of course, scooters and yeah. anything that makes us whiz and enjoy <laughs> ourselves. Now, you own a string of shops basically dealing in um, e scooters and e bikes. Yeah, we're bikes and barbers. So the idea is you can have a very nice haircut or a clean, <laughs> wet shave and walk out of there being mobile and awesome. enjoying your life. Feeling yeah. lighter all round. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and how did you first start getting into these? So in 2012, I moved to Waiheke Island and we just saw buses and cars and noise everywhere. And I thought, this is silly, there was so much an easier way and between one end of the other end and Waiheke gets such a short distance. And so we started electrifying bikes and electrifying scooters and then it got to be about taking the car and having the comforts of that onto the bike. And that's why I brought this helmet with as well, which will mm. actually sort of take the, the car out to your scooter or your bike. What? So it what will actually mean? allow you to indicate left, right, but most importantly, it will allow you to stay connected with the world. So you can take your phone calls, have your Google Maps, you've got speakers, microphone, podcasts, that and you can cool. even talk with your mates because this is also an intercom. So if you're riding with your family, you could actually say hello to your kids and not turn left at the next junction, but turn right and tell them to stop for ice cream. And, <laughs> and I can actually also switch <laughs> off, of course, the audio. So when I'm riding with my wife, I can turn her down, yeah. which is much better than in real life. <laughs> if only we could do that all the time. Exactly. I, I want one of those. Yes. Can we get one of those for Jesse? Yes, you could absolutely. <laughs> They're only $150. So yeah, it's got a panic button as well. Wow. So if you feel threatened one night, you can actually press the panic button and the St. John's Ambulance and Emergency Services will know where you are That's and really uh, can cool. actually respond to you. So if you fall off your bike as well and hurt yourself, it automatically sends out an emergency beacon. Yeah. So if we let this helmet fall and it stays still for 90 seconds, we'll have St. John's Ambulance here wondering what's going on. That's really state of the art. For 150 bucks, that's yeah, incredible. Yeah, it's crazy, yeah, yeah. 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 So that's, that's great value for a helmet. How much would a scooter set you back? So the Segway are actually the cheaper ones. They're around seven, eight hundred dollars, mm. and that comes with your warranties and everything. And it's relatively quickly paid back in terms of lime scooters or using others. Yeah. In that here, well, I don't know, but your average trips would definitely pay it in a year. Yeah, totally. And the batteries in them will last years and years. The lithium batteries are now unbreakable. So I mean, health and safety is a bit of a consideration with these things. Yeah, we're learning, eh? Yeah. yeah. It is like the horse and the car coming <laughs> into the world in 1900. We need to know how to ride a scooter and know how to behave around a bike. Yeah. And that's a learning curve. Yeah. And so what would the simple rules and tips be for that? I'd say definitely start gently. Yeah. Um, Not like I did. Exactly. Right? You, <laughs> you, you had a good start uh, as a way forward from there. I think, yeah, speed is all the essence, being aware of what it is you're doing, trying not to use the mobile phone as you as you go, you know. I don't think I could. <laughs> Concentrate. I don't think I could be doing and, that. Yeah, it's it's easy, really. I have not fallen off yet. Wow. Many yet. of my customers haven't. What what does happen occasionally is that people will do the hedge, so yeah. not really worry about the corner, but just continue straight. Straight. Yeah, and the hedge is soft, really, compared to buses and stuff, because that occasionally, of course, happens too. But what's nice with a scooter is that you do tend to jump off. Yes. So I see the person in one piece. And people usually come to me with their scooter in millions of pieces because yeah. they've jumped off <laughs> as the car reversed yeah. and sort of ended up with a scraped knee and the scooter has continued. Yeah. There is no seat belt to undo or anything like that. And you are only at a running speed. So 
if you get off running, you're safe. Yeah, and they're really popular now. Like, they're everywhere. It's like a kind of phenomenon. It is really that, yes. Yeah. It is, um, it's again, the horse and the cart and the car. So I'm hoping, like in New York, then 17 years from now, when the first car came to New York, it took 17 years for the last horse to leave. Wow. And I'm hoping that in 15 years from now, there'll be no more cars in CBD and we'll all be mobile and something that doesn't make a noise, that allows us to talk with one another and yeah. where there's no road rage and where we just have fun. Because mm -hmm. that's really what it's all about, just mm -hmm. moving and have fun. And where did you first encounter them? Ooh, that would have been 10 so years ago. Yeah. Then they were heavier and they had no range. And, and now they're just so together. What's fantastic with the new, bi new bikes and the new scooters is that they're so integrated. There is applications on your phone to turn the lights on and tell you how much charge you got so you can see if you can go to your girlfriends at night and make it all the way there. Yeah. And so yeah, what's the issue with charging? How does that work? You, you just, just plug it in like yeah. your iPhone Yeah. and you will very quickly learn to see just like a petrol gauge, how far you can go on what's left right. because everything else considered you weigh the same tomorrow yeah. and the path that you'll take home will usually involve the same gradients. So you will know that on a charge you'll get 30 kilometers or 40 kilometers or whatever. And that's what's amazing is that in terms of distance, you would never do 40 kilometers on a scooter. No. But that's what some of them do. Some of them do even do 100 kilometers on a scooter. And I'll challenge anyone to stand up on a scooter for 100 kilometers because <laughs> you'd just go, no, no, I don't want to be doing this. Is that a challenge? It. Exactly, I'll do it. Yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> so no, the idea is it's shorter distances, it's down to the pub, it's over to your mates. Yeah. It's that 10, 15 minutes where we take the car and where it's unnecessary. Yeah, brilliant. Well, listen, thank you so much for sharing the thank technology with us. us today. Thank you. And enjoy your scooter. I will. <laughs> Up next, Erica Amour on Raving for Grown Ups. Erica, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Now, you are the founder and producer of Symphony. What is Symphony? So, Symphony is a unique collaboration between orchestra, DJs, and vocalists performing the biggest dance tracks of the last 30 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. That sounds pretty <laughs> special. So, put in an orchestra with DJs is a little unusual. Yeah, yep. Um, there have been a few collaborations uh, around the world doing something similar, but uh, we're the first event in New Zealand. Yeah. So you founded it, where did you kind of get the idea from? Why did you decide, I want to do this? So I saw a clip of a similar event run in the UK called the BBC Ibiza Proms uh, by Pete Tong and the Heritage Orchestra and would have loved to have seen the event in New Zealand but knew that it was going to be some time before it came out our ways, if ever. Uh, so I thought, why not make a few phone calls and put it on myself? Wow, you, made it, you make it sound very easy. Oh, I'll just make a few phone calls, put it on myself. But it would be a big undertaking. It was a big undertaking, although it did kind of just start out that way. Of just, um, I called uh, the music director of the Auckland Symphony Orchestra, sent him the clip. He absolutely loved it uh, and said it was definitely something the orchestra wanted to be a part of. Mm. Uh, and we went from there. So if you attend, like, what can you expect? I'm thinking, is it for old people who like orchestra? Is it for young people who like kind of yeah. dance music? So it's definitely not a sit-down affair. Oh, okay. um, the, there's a GA dance floor, which is usually around 1,500 to 2,000 people, depending on which venue you're at. Um, and it is a full nightclub experience. So expect lasers, visuals, state-of-the-art audio. Um, you're in a club, but there's an orchestra there playing the tunes for you. Wow, that sounds incredible. Let's take a look. So what were the challenges that you faced in pulling it all together? So trying to organise 90 musicians on stage at any one time uh, can be a little bit of a logistical challenge. Yeah. Um, but to be honest, everything else ha has gone 
really well. We've definitely had some learnings over the years, mm -hmm. um, but it's been received phenomenally and every year we keep getting better um, and improving on what we've done last year, so. Yeah, and so what's your background? How did, it, how did your background bring you to this point? So I'm actually a chartered accountant. Oh <laughs> which I didn't expect that, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, that's usually the response I get. Um, but I was also a part-time DJ, so I've got a classical um, background uh, that took me into DJing and I had a show on George. Um, so that along with my sort of commercial and business acumen actually went quite well together yeah. um, to building the show. Where is the show? Where can we go and see it? So we're actually doing a tour this year. Um, so previously we've only done shows in Auckland which have been at the Auckland Town Hall. Uh, we've been in Brisbane uh, a few weeks ago at the Brisbane City Hall. Uh, we will be putting sh on shows at the Christchurch Town Hall two at the Auckland Town Hall, one in Hamilton, Claudelands, and one in TSB Arena in Wellington. Yeah, wow, so that, I mean, that would take a lot to pull off, to tour with 90 musicians and the lights and the everything. Yeah. Like financially, how does that all hang together? Yeah, so we do actually use local orchestras where we go, which is amazing. So mm -hmm. uh, for Christchurch, we're using the Christchurch Symphony, uh, Wellington, we're using Orchestra Wellington, and we worked with the Brisbane Philharmonic as well. Yeah. Um, so that definitely helps because, yes, as you said, putting 90 musicians on tour would be a huge undertaking. Huge boss, you know. <laughs> yeah, but we do tour with our key crew, so our conductor, our lighting director, visuals director, um, our, um, all our key vocalists. It's definitely a project that is for more for the passion than um, as a big money-making exercise because it is an expensive show to put on. Yeah. Um, but we love it and that's why we do it. Yeah, well that's brilliant and thank you so much for sharing it with us today. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. Up next, changing the direction of your life. Shal, welcome. Thank you. Hey, you're looking really dapper, may I say. Well, thank you. It's all, all part of the image. So. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta look good. Gotta exactly, look. Now exactly. Now listen, you're, you're the CEO of a company called Attain. Yes. And I'm really curious, did you grow up thinking you were going to be a CEO? <laughs> Uh, it's, it's an interesting question, Kath. So uh, I guess the, there's a reason for the suit and there's a reason um, for what I, why I do what I do these days. I would never have dreamed in my life growing up that I'd end up being the CEO of anything. Yeah. The whole reason for the suit is because growing up I had a couple of choices to make. I could either be in a suit like this or I could end up in a suit like my father did. So the suit that your father wore? So the suit that my father wears is one that you often would see in a prison. Uh, my father spent some time inside for the sort of violence that he did to myself and my sister and we were children growing up. Wow. Um, I come from that family of Once Were Warriors, sort of slash with a bit of glory of Val in there. Okay. And for those that don't know, Once Were Warriors is that iconic sort of New Zealand movie around uh, gangs and violence and mm -hmm. things like that. Glory Vale is obviously a more religious focused program that we see down in the South Island of New Zealand where um, you know, it's a, a religious cult where people are captivated by rules. And I say it's a mix between the both because for the first part of my childhood it was very much once with warriors. The second part changed into this cultish glory veil scene where my father got involved in, in religion and used religion as an excuse for the violence that he would do and for the lifestyle that he had chosen uh, as we were growing up. Wow, that would have been a pretty hard childhood. Yeah, I, I guess again for me, I don't like to think that it's different from what a lot of other people went through in the early 80s I guess and you know, mm. late 80s. But it's one that made me, at some point, have to make a choice as to which path I wanted to go on. Yeah. Uh, there was always that thing on TV that used to say, you know, break the cycle. And I'll never forget it. It was this ad that used to always play, break the family cycle of family yeah. violence. And uh, I like to think that that's what I'm working towards these days. Yeah. And was there a defining moment for you when you saw that choice? <laughs> Absolutely. I, easiest way to explain this is there was a moment where... I was probably about 15 years old and I'd had a big argument with my father and I decided to go out and take the car and just get out of get out of town. Hopped in the car, put it into gear, drove it as fast as I could into the fence. Oh my goodness. Did you know how to drive at this point? I had no idea. Oh, really. right. <laughs> <laughs> so here I am crashing into the fence and my wife's standing there. Now, my, I say my wife, but at the time I was 15, she was only about 14 years old. So I look out my window and there's this beautiful young lady standing there going, are you okay? And I'm going, oh my goodness, I think I'm dead. And you <laughs> yeah. married her? Well, yeah, fast forward a few years and, and funnily enough, her, I was able to marry her. Oh, that is so, so sweet. It's a bit dramatic, but, but it's sweet. Yeah, I guess it was that point where, where you go, I have a choice to make, you know, and I sit there and go, if I want to have that girl, if I want to have that life, I have to have a 
I have to go on a different path to where my father was taking me. Yeah. Uh, so those conscious decisions I made, uh, I haven't come from a family of wealth and things like that. I've come from literally nothing. Mm -hmm. So I spend my days trying to encourage others that come from that sort of background or from any background. It doesn't matter what you have, it matters what you do. Yeah. And that's the choices that I make. Yeah, and literally you cannot tell what a person has been through just by looking at them. Not at all. I, I remember when I was a builder, so as a qualified builder, so you don't there, look like a builder either. Not at all. You're very confusing. <laughs> exactly. But I, I started off actually in the workforce as a apprentice, and then worked my way up to become a qualified builder. And I remember as a builder, people would look at me and think that I was a uh, well-to-do middle-class white European, you know, Kiwi. And people had no clue where I'd come from and the work and the effort I had to put in to actually change from where I'd come from to where I was going to go. Yeah. Um, but yeah, appearances are always deceiving, hence the suit that I wear today. Yeah. Where would you be right now if you mm. hadn't met your wife? Uh, that's a good question. It's not so much about that. It's more about, I guess, the choice. Would I have made the choice to change? I think eventually, yes, I would have because it's just the mo that was the moment of change for me and there were a lot of influencing factors around that. I yeah. had uh, an uncle who was uh, really good at bringing me under his wing and trying to put me out of that family yeah. cycle as well uh, and I had obviously uh, other mentors that sort of got around me as well and helped me make good decisions. Yeah. Um, some of them were certainly a result of my wife and uh, meeting my wife. Um, where would I be today? I think if I hadn't have decided to change I could still be, uh, I don't know, being just a, the, the horrible person that I was being brought up and raised to be. Yeah. I mean, uh, I was being raised to be like my father, and that was not something that I want to be. And I look back on that, and there's no way I would ever want to be that, anyone to be like that. Um, and I think it's easy to sit back and go, but poor me, I didn't get the silver spoon, I didn't get things my way. Life's a challenge, and it's a struggle, and you've always got to make constant decisions to make it better. Yeah. How's your relationship with your father now? Uh, I haven't spoken to him for probably four years now, five years now. Yeah. So uh, I haven't seen him. I've tried to reach out. Uh, one of the things is that I don't hold any grudges or any um, bad feelings, ill feelings towards him. Uh, I think you've got to find a place to be able to forgive people and move on. Yeah. At the same time, I can forgive him without actually wanting to spend much time with him. Yeah. Um, I don't want to put my children under that influence these days and have that around them. So uh, he's been in prison. I'm not sure if he's out yet or not. but. Mm -hmm. Um, I haven't spoken to him since uh, since we went down the court cases and, and trying to tidy that up. Yeah. If he were to see this interview, what do you think he would think or say? Well, if he saw this interview, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I really struggle to understand him. I really struggle to understand, um, uh, you know, I guess, how he can uh, do what he did. But at the same time, I also feel empathy towards him and I feel like, Maybe he was just really struggling with a few things himself that he couldn't, demons he couldn't quite get past. Um, what would he think of this interview today? He, he might not like me talking about it. He might not like me mm -hmm. saying what I'm saying. And on the flip side, I hope he'd be proud and go, look, you've made a different path and you're making a better future. So, uh, you know, I'm a father myself and I know if my kids do better than me, I'd be absolutely proud. Yeah. So what would you say to a person who's facing some choices in their life and, you know, they can go one way or the other way? Uh, I think what I would say to them is you... you you can't make excuses, you know, and that's the first thing. You just have to accept everything for what it is. I can make a lot of excuses to, uh, to just be a bum. I can make a lot of excuses to sit at home and do nothing. I could have made excuses to walk away from wanting to work and earn an income and provide for my family. Uh, you just got to stop making excuses, mm -hmm. you know, and it, people get caught up in, oh, but it's my right or it's not fair or it's, there's always some reason. But once you start taking ownership and go, look, I'm just going to own my future. I don't care what's happened in my past. Uh, I've got this thing where I, I want to be the most successful, unsuccessful person you will ever meet. You <laughs> the, know? the most successful, unsuccessful person. That's it. I want to be the most successful, unsuccessful person you will ever meet. I think we all fail. Everyone has a story. And so when I um, hop on stage and I speak and work with different companies, and that, I don't go there to go, oh, poor me. And sitting here, I'm not wanting to even go, poor me. Yeah, I get what that. I want to do is encourage people that you just have to move on. Yeah. You, know, you have to get back up. If you've made a mistake, if you've fallen over, if you've failed at something, just get back up and try again. Oh, that's fantastic advice for all of us. Thank you so much for joining us right. on the show. No problem. Thank you.
welcome. Thanks for joining me here today. My question to you is, how confident are you when you speak in public? How confident would you be doing an elevator pitch like this one? The truth is, if you are not supremely confident every time you speak, you're not the best ambassador for your business. Right. You're not the one who's going to get that job promotion. And you're simply not the person you were born to be. Get happy when you speak and you'll discover confidence you never knew you had. And those results will show up everywhere. Wild, here you are again. Great to be here. So tell me, who is recording with us today? Well, for the last couple of years, we've been doing an epic album called The Vasey Collective. Mm. And Rob Vasey, an incredible songwriter, um, got a really good collection of songs together. And we got the most amazing musicians from around New Zealand to perform on it. And we've got a stripped down version today with Anthony Picard and John Kemp. Wow, that sounds exciting. Let's hear from The Vasey Collective. Let's do it. When I got the call on the telephone
guys, thank you and welcome, okay. Rob. Congratulations on the thank Basie you. Collective. Thank you very much. So uh, you wrote the song, right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Great. And what did you write? I know there's a big story behind this. Uh, a friend of mine passed away with cancer and um, that song there, uh, I got the phone call. And as I got the phone call, I wrote the song straight after I got the phone call. So wow. about 15 minutes later, the song was finished. Wow. And uh, when, I, uh, when I went through uh, the process um, of getting it recorded, Ants put a put a few extra words in there, and and that's that's how it ended up. Yeah, oh, mm. really good. Because you're you're a bit of a magnet for musicians, aren't you? You've put together this entire collective. How did that come about? Well, it uh, well it actually happened over a couple of years ago, and and with the helps of Jesse Wild, mm. um, we come into the studio, and it all sort of started from there. I had no idea who the who the singer or the guitarist and all that were going to happen, and and so what happened was we sat down, we did the we did the um, the guide tracks, and then slowly people started appearing from all over the place, even uh, around the world. Wow. And then, yep. and um, John and Ants, and yeah, it just it just grew into what it is now. And and I must say, it's just unbelievable who we've got on the show. Uh, and and we've been nominated for four New Zealand Music Awards. For yeah, this. Four, four awards. Yeah. And that's pretty incredible. I remember when Rob first came, um, he had a collection of songs, and I sat down and I said, Rob, you need to sing these. Um, and, he, <laughs> and Rob, Rob's, he's, I'm not a singer. Because you were a drummer, right? Yeah. A drummer originally. Yeah. yeah. But I really wanted Rob's take on the vocal, and, and we did. We, we, it, Rob did most of the guide guitars, and, and we, we had a, a vocal for each song, yeah. and that's what we went out to find the other musicians right, with. Yeah. Yeah. So when you just needed, I needed to know how Rob wanted, wanted to sing the song, and I think it, it just worked out perfectly that they got to hear your vocal, and um, the way Ants took it from there, and Johnny, his guitar playing, everything just came together incredibly well. I can see that you've handpicked your musicians and really created something spectacular. Yeah, and the fact that they're playing on all the tracks um, and having um, having backing singers and that come in, and it's just amazing. You know, getting a world class singer like Ants yeah. and a world class guitarist like John. <laughs> yeah. They're I mean, smiling behind <laughs> you. They're like, oh, shut, <laughs> stop. Well, the thing, the thing that people don't realise is they only met an hour ago. Oh my goodness. One hour ago, they met each other for the first time <laughs> yeah. and they just go and bang that out. I think that's wow. amazing. The people I played the album to, they, it's got this real live feel, you know, like the band, the guys really know each other. And we did use all live musicians. Yeah. But yeah, a lot of the people, like the, um, a lot of people had never met. So, what's it like being part of the collective, guys? You know, we've had fun of we've made new mates too, you know. <laughs> I mean, we've all been doing it a long time, but we've made new mates. Like, we've been. I think we'll be mates now. We're tight, yeah. Yeah, yeah we're tight, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <You like that. laughs> I think it all starts with great songs. And uh, when you've got great songs, um, great things are going to happen. And Rob put this all together, and I, I'm really proud to be the producer. Congratulations, Rob. It's fantastic. Thank you. Cool. My thanks to all my special guests. To Christian, to Erica, to Sean, the Vasey Collective, and of course, our very own Jesse Wild. And until next time, don't wait to wake up your wow. <laughs> he told me not to press accelerate, and I couldn't help it. And I didn't even get that out of it, I should have gone there out of it, shouldn't I?